Federated Farmers and Farms in the Wairarapa with a family business that's been around a while and, um, and, and has a bit of scale and a large team there so all that points towards uh, a very passionate farmer uh, that's passionate about his industry and, and it's a privilege to, to be here to uh, share, share that passion and, and hear his story. So all over to you William, questions at the end. Um, yeah, good morning. Um, it's, uh, oh, sorry, afternoon. Um, it's uh, quite intimidating with such a large room, especially being half filled. I thought something else was slightly more interesting than me. But anyway, I'll, I'll endeavour to struggle through what, um, what I want to talk about today um, and just hopefully, probably give, um, give you guys a, probably a bit of a different perspective on um, what people might not think about the industry. And um, I suppose more think about what our businesses are and what might actually be really, really probably the most important thing. Um, a bit of background with me, um, yeah, we have a long history in sheep and beef farming in Wairapa, uh, currently clocking close to 160 years. Um, myself, once I left school, I did a couple of years shepherding and then went to Lincoln University. Um, after that, I took on a professional career, which started out in Gisborne and then stretched to England. Um, in England, I did a lot of work in, I suppose, the collaboration space, um, working for, primarily with the Ministry of uh, Defence, focusing on land management plans to integrate different uses with the, with the land there. Um, then moved to Australia, um, did management systems and focused on business manager's role um, before effectively we came back and uh, decided to take over the farm. Three years ago we set up um, a new business which we uh, used as a focus to, I suppose, leverage off the family assets we had, but more importantly, separate it out and leverage off our family history to grow our business and protect it for the future. And I suppose, hopefully when I move through this, you kind of get a bit of a picture about um, what's really important about what we do. Um, a few things I thought I'd just like to talk about when we first start, or a few concepts um, that, that I use on a regular basis, which I think are really important. Um, can you all hear me, or I don't see over here? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, the first concept uh, that I, I heard once from a uh, American football coach in America, and it's around excellence. And he talks about the perfect game. Um, and he said that, you know, there's never the perfect game. Nobody ever does anything perfectly. But what there is is a perfect effort within the game you're playing. And I think that's a really important concept. Another important concept around um, when we're trying to achieve things, I think it's, um, and it's probably quite prudent now on the, um, in the east coast of the Wairapa, especially around our region, um, where we're going through a severe drought. Um, just a couple of questions. Who is considered the greatest All Black of all time? Anybody shout out? Richie McCaw. Richie McCaw. Who is, uh, is recognised the greatest All Black captain of all time? Richie McCaw. Who led um, the All Blacks to successive World Cup victories? Unprecedented. Richie McCaw. Who led the All Blacks to the 2007 failure of the World Cup? So the point is, is that in the darkest times, when things become the most difficult, when the chips are down, that is actually when uh, people stand up and shine. And if you don't have people give those people that ability, then, uh, then great things don't happen. Cool. Um, this is my clicker here. So yeah, it comes down to, it's all about the people. Um, thinking about, you know, the All Blacks, um, when they went through their process, uh, after the 2007 World Cup, um, they didn't uh, they didn't throw the toys. They looked at um, they they looked at their processes and what they did. And there's a lot of things that they changed through what, with what they did. Um, the All Blacks didn't turn around their um, I suppose didn't turn around their team or what the situation they're in by focusing on new technology. Um, they didn't focus on um, fantastic, amazing new sports training systems. Would have been a part of it. But the All Blacks, they looked at, um, at areas like uh, individual performance improvement plans. They looked at consensus leadership within the group. They looked at how the group, how the people performed under pressure. They looked at accountability, self-sufficiency. The point probably out of that, that I took out of, out of, I suppose, those learnings, was that whether if it's rugby, farming, business or sport, in the end, it was all about the people. Everything that we do within our business, with what we do, 
requires people. And we can either have them working with us or against us. And for us, it's a more important process to have them working with us. Um, we cannot operate our business without our suppliers, our customers, and as importantly, our employees. Um, what I'll just run a three, quick three minute video that probably expands on, I suppose, a few of those concepts. If we could run that. I'm saving when to stop. If it's gonna work. Can't see it. next couple of days, you probably hear a lot about how to make better design, how to execute better, how to consider your clients or the end user when you're doing what you have to do. And I'd like to add another, another item to the list to consider as you sit here for the next two days, which is how can you help the human race? How can you help the human race, the human species, progress? I'm not joking either. This is something I think we all have to be aware of. At the end of the day, the human animal is a social animal. And our very survival depends on our ability to form communities, to form cultures. What's a community? What's a culture? It's a group of people with a common set of values and beliefs, right? What's a country? It's a group of people with a common set of values and beliefs. What's a company? It should be a group of people with a common set of values and beliefs. When we're surrounded by people who believe what we believe, something remarkable happens. Trust emerges. And make no mistake of it, trust is a feeling, a distinctly human feeling. You know, we, we all have friends who are total screw-ups and yet we still trust them, right? <laughs> trust is not a checklist. Simply doing everything you say you're going to do does not, does not mean people will inherently trust you. It just means you're reliable. We need trust, right? We need trust. When we're surrounded by people who believe what we believe and trust starts to emerge and we trust them and they trust us, we're more willing to take risks. We're more willing to experiment, which requires failure. We're more willing to explore and go somewhere that no one has ever gone before with the confidence that if we fail, if we trip over, if we turn our backs, that those within our community, those who we trust and who trust us, will look after us while we're gone, will pick us up when we fall over, will help us when we're hurt. Our very survival depends on it. We're not good at everything. We're not good by ourselves. You know, if I send you out to go fight a saber-toothed tiger by yourself, odds are tiger one, you zero. It's not gonna go very well. But if you go out as a group, we're pretty damn amazing. And the reason is, is because we all have our constraints and we all have our certain weaknesses. And the goal is not to fix your weaknesses. The goal is to amplify your strengths and surround yourself with the people who can do what you can't do. But it's not just based on skills and, and application and experience. It's based on what you believe. It's based on what you believe. You see, simply being good at something and having somebody else being good at what you're no good at does not mean you will trust each other. Yeah, trust, just kind of the deep. sense of trust comes from the sense of common values. And... Um, so Simon Sinek's uh, far better than me at getting across this point, but uh, <coughs> the key aspect here, and um, you can Google any of his TED Talks, but is understanding that um, you know, it's actually okay to fail. Um, everybody, you know, we put effort in, but it's so important that we have people and support around us, a community around us to achieve things. When we have that support, then we can always get up and move forward. And then that becomes the same as a business. Um, you know, anybody who runs a business knows things won't work sometimes. And it won't work for the people that you're employing or for other people who are involved in your business, but being able to bring them together and pick them up. You know, you hear, I heard an amazing thing today of what uh, the um, Tyra Fitty Women's Trust is doing. And you know, they just did the same thing. They, they, they connected with people, brought a community of people together, created that circle of trust, and they're achieving great things. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, really good message there. And another good message that Simon Sinek puts across, which I'll put across slightly different, it's amazing how, you know, you have um, somebody who lives in, um, in Kaitai and somebody lives in, in, in Vicargo, wouldn't know each other, walk to each other in the same pub in Wellington, wouldn't even talk to each other. 
you know, willing to recognise each other. In fact, if they said that, the ice cream in Kabul, they'd probably you know, talk to them down there, they have six fingers. But then, those same two people, they go over to London. They walk into a pub in London, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Invercargill. I'm from Kaitaia. Wicked. Best of mates. You know, that's the concept of community, that relationship. The fact that there becomes a common boundary and a set of values in some way that's strange. Bring that together and it brings people together. Um, understanding that people want to believe um, and understanding what we do and embracing that and why we do it um, gives us a huge amount of power to connect people, drive people, give people belief. When you throw a set of values around that and you demonstrate those values, then you can drive people all in that same direction. And values are really, really important to, to, to work with and demonstrate. And so that's a um, key component. So by understanding your why or giving people something to believe, you create your vision or purpose. When you create that vision and purpose and drive it with your values, you drive it through your business, it becomes an incredibly powerful thing to not only coordinate your staff and everybody else involved, but you can also use it to coordinate everybody around you, your suppliers, your customers, and create alignment. Um, just an exercise put up there, you know, that, that saying there, he, um, he who has a why can endure anyhow, um, and that's a really important concept, as you actually know why you're doing things, if you actually connect with that emotionally, and we as farmers do it all the time, but we don't realise it, you know, going through drought, talk to anybody outside the industry, they just go, what are you thinking? Sell, sell your, sell your business. We, we don't connect with why, but we do it for certain reasons, which I'll approach on time, but we know how. We, we begin to find how, how we move through these processes. Beginning to connect to your why really helps. Uh, so another concept that I think is quite important and using the All Blacks is another great example. Um, success is directly related to the people in your corner, not who you beat on the way. We'll just speed this up. You know, if you actually look at I can't really use a pointer from here. There's a guy right up in the top left corner, um, be your yeah, top left corner um, behind Richie McCaw. Nobody any, has any idea who that person is. Who is he? He was as important at being on that stage as all the players that were on that field. You know, group of people, consensus leadership, um, everybody in behind the team going in the same direction. To achieving that point, they got all those people together to achieve that. Did they worry about who, what teams they were going to beat? I don't think they were worried about that. They were worried about what they were going to achieve. They weren't worried, or worried about scraps that they were going to have on the field or who they were going to take down. It was about bringing a group of people together under one mantra, under one leadership people process to achieve something greater. Um, so if you think that how that reflects to the business, you know, I have a saying that I say to my kids all the time, if you get into an argument, you've already lost. Straightforward. As soon as you get into conflict with people, you've lost. However, if you look at our suppliers or our customers that we work with in our business, if they're all directed within our why and what we're trying to achieve, then they're going to want you to succeed. And if, you don't, if they don't want you to succeed, then you don't want them as a supplier because you're going to be buying their, their information, you're going to be using them. And then they're going to leverage off you to get more customers on board. So having that coordination with them and using them as a support network is just so vital for your business. Same with your customers. You know, if you're a good supplier, you know, if you're a good, um, if you're a good supplier to a customer, they want what you've got. And creating that relationship, even in our industry, is just absolutely vital. Um, yeah, so success is based around, um, is, is based around solving problems um, and using relationships and processes to do that. And so when you've got a huge amount, when you've got customers, suppliers, and everybody within your team working towards the same direction, then you've got a whole lot of people who are willing to solve problems for you, support you, community around you. Um, it's pretty hard to get anything done when the relationship's pretty frosty. And we determine those as partnerships. Uh, just quickly, what drives us? So how are we trying to put, how are we putting this in practice and what we do? Um, our why um, is based around family and legacy. We've been there for 160 years. If I don't fulfil my role, then um, 160 years of legacy is gone, and that's when I lie on my deathbed, that's all people will talk about. So for me, our legacy and my responsibility to pass it on to my children and give them the understanding and responsibility for the future is, is, is vitally important for what we do, what we do. 
Without that, without a strong community around us, a strong rural community that's prosperous, um, that has a good school, um, that has, you know, I'm a member of Federated Farmers, that has a strong um, legacy group to protect our interests. Without those communities existing around us, I don't have a legacy to protect going forward into the next future. Without a strong industry that's um, productive and going forward, we don't have that either. And industry, whether of people in uh, certain parts of New Zealand like it or not, especially the sheep and poop industry, has been the backbone and committed significant amounts of, uh, to New Zealand's prosperity over the years. So, you know, that's pretty cool. When we start talking about that amongst our group, about the team, why we're doing things, and how that benefits, you know, some way, team's children, or where they're going to go in the future, it's pretty powerful stuff. And when times are tough, if you can focus on the why, again, it really helps you endure the how. Um, just a quick little, I suppose, a little bit about the future. Um, another thing that I'm, we're really trying to focus on in our business, um, not so much, and this doesn't apply just to children, but it's, you know, don't give them so much as they do nothing. Um, give them enough to do something. So it's actually, I mean, anybody can sell a farm, go and invest it, and everybody goes off and has a good holiday, and that's cool, You're relating it to farming. What we're trying to do is give our children and the people who are involved in our business um, a, a sense of industry, legacy, to take forward into the next future. So we're actually giving them something more, something emotional, that they can attach to and then take on the next responsibility to protect it for the future. I believe that it's really important for my children to understand what we have is built out of the blood, sweat and tears of previous generations, and we have a responsibility to protect that for the future. And that becomes a pretty powerful driving force, whether if you're talking about succession, or whether if you're talking about getting people into the industry or moving them through, through the industry. Uh, probably move a little bit more into down into the structural side. Um, we look at now, once we've established our purpose and values, um, just with regards to strategy, we need to understand uh, what sandbox we're playing in. Um, understanding what sandbox we're playing in is really important in strategy. Often, how many strategies are written when uh, people think of, um, of how we're going to win the game? When they actually don't know what game they're playing, they might not even know who they're playing, and they don't actually under, sometimes under, know what field they're playing on. Happens all the time. Good way to put an example of this um, is rugby versus rugby league. Going back to a nice one that everybody can relate to. Um, you think about Sonny, Sonny Bill Williams. When he switched from rugby league to rugby, what did he do? Did he run out straight onto a rugby field, get a Super 12 contract with the best Super 12 side and say, right, I'm gonna switch codes and get into it and I'm gonna be in the All Blacks. Didn't. He went to France he played in a lower level of rugby. He played around some of the best players in the world that were moving into retirement. He worked hard on learning the game. He then came back into a successful Super 12 transport, trans, well, Super, Super Rugby franchise. Spent a bit of time getting his ground there. He actually made the All Blacks. And then he went on to be part of a, of a successful you know, um, Chiefs franchise in the World Cup. But he went through a whole process because he knew that if he transferred himself straight onto the playing field when he actually hadn't got himself established in the box, sandbox he was playing in, he wouldn't have been successful. Um, comparison, Benji Marshall, great rugby league player, outstanding rugby league player. Jumped from league, went straight over to um, the Blues rugby, rugby franchise, poor culture, didn't understand the game. How, many, how long did he last? Not that he wasn't a fantastic player, but he hadn't had a strategy around you know, understanding the sandbox he was going to play in. Um, a couple of other points probably when we're thinking about strategy. You know, strategy doesn't need to be a big document. It's a small, it's a small, small document, and it's actually about asking the right questions. Who's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? The answer to the universe and everything was 42. Everybody's really confused. What does that mean? We well, didn't ask the right question. Key thing about strategy is asking about the right question. What are we trying to uh, and defining that key question? Then you get the answer, which is easy. Once you once you've defined what your worthy challenge is, then you can go through a process of uh, understanding what your approach is, have your targets, and then go five year through process. And you know, the one thing I've learned about how we're implementing strategy or what I've seen in the past is it's simple. Two pages, very simple, but constantly driven by your why, your how, your purpose, your vision, your values, all of that process. 
Um, just a little bit of experience we've learned because we've um, been focusing on trying to establish um, good governance process with our business. Um, you know, governance, it takes the why, turns it into strategy. So again, it's all part of the strategy I just talked about. Governance is about bringing people together to achieve something great. It's not about ruling over things. Um, again, governance, and governance comes in many different forms, but it's all about focusing again on those agreed values and the way you operate. Um, got to understand that if we're in a business, often we wear hats as we might be trustees, we might be shareholders, we might be farm managers, um, all of these other aspects, we're wearing many different hats. We need to understand that and understand what those different hats mean and our responsibilities. New health and safety, uh, new health and safety legislation is becoming really important to understand that. Um, and also that you might need different skills and expertise. Creates accountability, um, and as I said before, there's many different forms of governance. It can be um, formal governance, it can be informal. Uh, just a graph um, that I whacked in. Um, this is a really important concept for today. Um, this is the information which I can't remember what came out of some university in, in, in America. But what it basically is called a business optimization. So we've got improvement up the top there, everybody's improving, or status quo, quo line or stagnation. And then um, we've got uh, decline on the left hand side. Basically what that says is uh, uh, the red one is repetitive practices. Do the same thing every year, year after year. You're actually in decline. Everybody's passing you. It's the most obvious thing. The next one is uh, sustained practices. So you're getting a little bit of gain, you might be doing slight a little bit of improvement, but you're actually just running on those sustained practices. The green one is um, best practice. And the actual argument is that best practice sits right on the line. So if we're operating under best practice, we're still operating just above stagnation. The right hand side one is innovation. If we're innovative in the every way that what we do, we're gonna make mistakes, but we're gonna be ahead of the game. In the long term, we're gonna be ahead of the game. So innovation is just crucial to our businesses and our people. Um, which then drives us down to high, perform high performance culture. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a little diagram that somebody showed me recently, but basically it might be hard to see in the middle there, but it says high performance culture. Um, and it's actually got three building blocks that we're focusing on around a high performance culture. Uh, so the top one is purpose, which we've already talked about. The other one uh, to, to, down the, um, which would be your bottom left hand side, is A players, which I'll talk about next, and then the other part is the systems to achieve. Um, culture within business is banded around all the time. Um, really good example, and I was thinking about this the other day, is that um, people talk about a great culture um, in, in a company like Google. When you're looking at Google, what have they got? They've got um, sleep pods and they've got slides going through the middle of the of the um, of the organisation. So when you're talking about culture, everybody goes, oh, well, let's go have a team building day, right? That'd be great. Let's go have a team building day. You know, you look at Google, well, let's build a slide on the farm. I'm not sure that'll be useful. A bit more of a hindrance than anything else. But the key, the key aspect is when you look at Google, what they've done is that they've looked at their people. What do their people want? They're introverted. They like being inside. They like being slightly different, you know? They don't let them, they don't get, you know, they don't um, give them opportunities to mingle with the outside world, which they really like. <laughs> um, so, you know, if we're looking at what creates a good culture within our business and what we're trying to focus on, our business is hard. You know, hot, dusty, wet, cold, stressful. Animals, animals don't behave. What drives our culture is, is, is our why um, and, and, and our beliefs and our values and working towards actually enjoying what we're doing. You know, actually being out there and looking over the land that we, and say, listen, what would this land look like if, if we're not here? Just need to drive down somewhere and look at the gorse patches in certain areas or where there's dead schools or where there's empty houses. You know, that's, that's, that's what we're working towards to ensure we protect that for the future. Um, it is an area that I'm concerned about in our business though, because you know when the chips are down, it's something that we've got to really, really focus on driving that culture. And that high performance culture. Um, and, and a lot of that of what we're working on now is focusing on making sure we've got systems and support networks in to help our team to achieve what we want to achieve, what our, what our, strategic, what our strategic plan wants us, well, requires us to achieve. You know, I suppose every business had a culture, but is it a, is it a 
appropriate culture or high performance culture. Um, probably moving into the to the team players and how we approach um, how we approach our team within our business. Um, this was passed on to me by a chap called um, Sam Hazeldine, who is an entrepreneur um, and runs a, a big company which he developed and is operating some other companies. C players. What that lady's doing there is picking up shit. <laughs> C players. When you run around behind C players, all you're doing is picking up their shit. Who's got time to do that? B players. You're running around carrying the B players. They're good at what they do and they, they they're part of the business, but do they believe in where we're going? Are they part of our vision, or are you constantly trying to carry them? A players, those are the dudes with the wind in your sails, who believe in what you believe in, who are going to follow you with what you do. You know, those are the people who um, may be outside your business, but are standing there wanting to be a part of it and wanting to support you through your journey. A process we're going through is um, creating a little bit of a, an inventory and looking at what, um, I suppose, what is the key diagnosis between things that happen. Uh, now, this does actually refer to a few people, um, but uh, I've obviously used other names. So we've got Harold here, who's a shepherd. He's got a, um, what are we giving him? We're giving him a C grade. What's the diagnosis? A knowledge gap. But he wants to do better. Well, it's a pretty easy action. You know, if that person really wants to advance and, and, and it's a knowledge gap, then, uh, then training, we've got to train them, turn them into to, to, to somebody who's going to be the wind in our sails. Uh, C, uh, the next C player we've got here is Sean. He's an agronomist. He's outside the business. You call him, never returns your calls. He's not proactive in managing crops. Um, doesn't understand our business, not really clear. That person's going to cost you a fortune in your business. He's out of there. He's gone. Uh, next we've got John as a farm manager, uh, good skill set, won't follow systems, which creates a poor culture, performance management. Uh, then we've got Tim, who's a general hand, he's a great skill set, um, and he's motivated, consistently complaining about equipment. When we actually get into the diagnosis of that process, you understand that um, you know, we actually have to review the resources we're applying and the culture or the issue that's facing there is the fact that we don't have good equipment. Tractor breaks down all the time, you know. Th those are the issues that uh, often can be facing our team, which we're hiding from. Then we have um, Rangi, who's a farm consultant, and he is constantly positive, providing options, invested in the business. We want to develop a reciprocal relationship with that person. So we want to use that person to grow our business, to be invested in our business, what we do, and we want to look at, okay, we're going to pay them fees, but what else can we do to reciprocate that arrangement? Because the more we reciprocate that, the more invested they're going to become in what we're doing. Um, and then we have Olivia, who is an actual person, um, who's motivated, bubbly, enjoys, likes, um, everybody likes her, and she's hard working and loves her job. We want to promote and invest. Those are the people we want to promote and invest in in our business. Um, just uh, moving on from that, there are different types of people which you can have in your organisation. So equals, they can be equal, they can have the same knowledge base as you, um, they can have a skill base as you, they can be leaders, but they can be introverted, they can be inside leaders or outside leaders. Outside leaders are the people who stand up front, inside ones are who keep in, inside the business, make things ticking over, make sure things work, all those sorts of systems. You can have your um, travellers, those on a journey, on a career path to farm ownership, um, and then you can have industrialised. Those are happy within their role and just ticking on in their team. But each one of those different individuals will have different needs and different requirements, and it's so important that you understand that because then you can meet their needs. If you meet their <coughs> needs, they will then be a part of your community, be a part of your vision, help you achieve. They will go that extra mile to achieve what you need to achieve. Um, Uh, I just probably just thought I'd talk to you a little bit about um, our recruitment process, and again, nothing here is anything that I've come up with magically. Um, it's all stolen. Um, <laughs> uh, so when we looked at this process, um, recruiting eight players, and we've made mistakes. I used to recruit a lot of people overseas, um, and I made some terrible mistakes. So we just really focus on trying to get the recruitment right whenever we're recruiting new people into our team. 
Our team's not that big yet, but we're anticipating on being big. So the first thing is that we never just shoulder tap. We advertise, and if we see people that we really want to be a part of our business, we then go and shoulder tap them and ask them to apply. The difference is, is that if they believe in what you believe in and they want to be a part of your business, they will make the effort to apply. You know, if they, if they can't be bothered to put an application in, then they feel like you're better, they're better than you. Do you think that's really going to be an asset to your business? Ask for three simple things. Covering letter, um, resume, and um, two references. If somebody can't get that right, do you really want them in your business? Phone interview. A stringent interview business, uh, interview process. So first of all, phone interview, and we do this for shepherds. We even do this for university students we recruit. Um, so getting on the phone, having a little bit of a chat, understanding, asking a few questions. Um, then a casual interview, and it might be meet for a cup of coffee or meet somewhere. And then a formal interview, which we go around the farm process. The reason why we go to such lengths, and we've learned to go to such lengths, is because we do not want to be down the process of recruiting people and for it to fail because it costs us a fortune. If we're a growing business and we don't have people on board doing what we need to do, then we will lose money and as a growing business, we can, yeah, that could cost us our business. Um, next area that we're focusing on in terms of um, how we're driving people and what we're trying to achieve is um, we're, we're working on systems. And it's, this has been a really interesting one. I did a lot of work on um, developing management systems in Australia for a company there, and I thought, right, I'm going to come back and start a farm, and I'm going to have it all systemised, and every, we're going to have a big team, and everybody's going to do what they're told. And that didn't work. Um, I found that systems were, uh, in a farm, it's so dynamic. Um, you know, it's an annualised biological system, and when you come round to the next year, you look to do a continual improvement process, and that doesn't work, because the next year's different. It'll go a big drought, <laughs> nothing works. So we focused on, um, so we're just still focusing on our systems and have been for a long time. We have strong plans that are data driven, you know, based on facts and trying to get those facts right. Um, so, um, and systems that are data driven, um, and then making sure that the teams are resourced and we got strong resources in place for them to, to achieve what we want to achieve. But the key thing that we've just found re recently is a rhythm process. Yeah, we've got, we've got two managers that we employ at this point in time. Every morning, they, uh, myself and two managers, we do about a 30 second, 40 seconds to a minute on WhatsApp, telling what we're up for the day, what are our problems are, and what we're going to achieve. Just to get, make sure we're all working in the same direction, trying to achieve the same thing. And then if there's something that needs to be solved, we park it and come back to it later, or we can have a quick WhatsApp <coughs> discussion. And then we go down to weekly, we go down to monthly, we go down to annually, or quarterly, then annually. But the key is just trying to, systems are all very good, but if we can't coordinate the people and get everybody in the right direction, it just doesn't work. Uh, just another concept that people might be interested in helping people with, say, personal development plans or helping people move through the year, um, outcome-driven management. So this is a concept where you actually focus on understanding what is the outcome. So obviously our outcome here is dollars. So once we know our outcome, we, we, we know where we're striving to, what we're going to do. Once we know our outcome, we can begin to put key performance indicators, which is a term everybody would be really familiar with, around that. But with our key performance indicators, we go to our staff and we say, right, go and achieve this. This is our key performance indicators will get us our outcome. Great, fantastic. The key step in there is critical drivers. Unless our staff and people and, and, and you know, farming's another a great example, different areas have different aspects that drive performance, different environments, different um, disease issues, all those other sorts of things. Critical drivers are about if you do this, if you do this and you get this right, that will achieve your KPI and that will get your outcome. And that is a key step to the process, understanding what our critical drivers are. Here I've just put basic example, critical drivers, you know, you've got fat ewes, you feed them a lot of grass, you get a lot of lambs, you make money. But, you know, one mistake I know I made is I constantly left out critical drivers and expecting people to know those. Uh, another concept, um, just quickly, bold leadership. So understanding that um, there always has to be somebody who's leading the business or leading things, and that could be somebody who's, um, who has a purpose, um, must live the values, must be compassionate, yet be able to have the hard conversation, resourceful, and never give up. 
the key issue to understand with that, and the issue I struggle with it, is I'm too compassionate. Sometimes you've got to have the hard conversation, and sometimes you've got to be able to be compassionate. And sitting in that middle is a really difficult time when you're trying to lead a team. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that can be a very, very difficult process. Somebody also said once to me that um, HR kills culture. And my wife did a lot of work in HR and she got really upset when I put that phrase to her. But what that means is that sometimes in an HR situation, you've got to have the really, really tough conversation and that doesn't fit within the uh, HR manual. So um, basically that's the end of what I had to say. But just moving back for us, you know, why? Um, why am I up here? Why do we do what we do? Why am I trying to move forward um, with our family and our business? Is that we believe in our family and its legacy, our family legacy. Um, the, rural, the future of the rural community, the sheep and beef industry and its contribution to our country. Every time I have a meeting with a team, put that up there. Probably don't do it enough. Oh, sorry. And that leads us to our vision. Um, sorry, our vision, a community sheep and beef farming business based on joint venture partnerships, pastoral production, um, sorry, pastoral performance, I should say, through partnerships. So what I've tried to do is just go through that whole journey is, I suppose, how we get to that and how we're driving our business forward. That's me, thank you. Uh, well done, William. Your ability to uh, articulate is always impressive. And yeah, there's a lot to think about and digest there. So, you know, um, yeah, people, um, values, innovation, communities, um, yeah, leadership, it, it goes right through. So, um, so yeah, we've probably got time for a couple of quick questions. So, hand you over to the floor. Uh, just a quick question, William. Um, the last slide there you've got um, based on joint venture partnerships, just so I can get some context. You know, don't need to explain them, but what are some examples of joint ventures? Well, the idea is that. Um is through partnerships, whether if it's within, um, uh, externally outside of our business, we saw that that's what we could leverage to grow our business. So we're looking to um, create partnerships with people who have trouble with, I suppose, running and maintaining their land, and how we can use our skills and, 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 and what we're building to help them move that forward, we create a partnership. We grow our business, we use their land resource, but they get a lot from us because we look after their land resource and we provide information. So that's our process, but that also exists outside in terms of our suppliers and our customers. It's trying to bring the concept of partnerships and where we can find joint ventures to leverage to create something better. Cool. So you talk a lot about partnerships, and I think specifically about your um, um, strategy and then having your staff give you an outcome. How do you reward them for that? Yeah, good question. So. Um, <coughs> And this is an area where we've, we've really struggled to get it right. So um, we've provided um, bonuses in terms of achieving the outcome-driven management plan, and that's worked to a degree. Um, but the key aspect is that we've got to be much better at connecting at what's important to the people who are working for us. And most people would know here that often it's not money. Um, so I think of a particular situation at this point in time, we've got um, a, a, a manager who you know, really struggles to actually spend time with his family um, and get away with his family, it's just not something that they do. If they achieve their outcomes, we said, listen, we'll put all your family on a plane and send you to a, um, for, for a week in Australia. Now, people go, well, that's a bit bloody radical, but how important is that? Yeah, it might cost us five grand, but what could we get out of that by saying, listen, you know, we believe in family, we're about family, let's bring people together and help them actually get that out of our business. You know, he's an industrialised employee, he doesn't want anything more, but what we're going to do is give him time with his family. That's great. One more quick question from the crowd. Done it. Boom. Yes, awesome. <laughs> yeah, a lot to think about. And yeah, once again, um, yeah, we, we put, put our hands together. That's very, very impressive. Thank you. Very much. <laughs>